when you see that a movie is in the literally me genre, it's, it doesn't really tell you much except that it's about an alienated young man. One thing that Spotify does really well is you can create and share playlists. And I find that really lacking in the film space. This is the other big part of movie watching and cinema. People will hang around and you talk for like 30, 40 minutes just about the movie. I feel like that communal experience is super, super important to watching films. The bad movies of yesteryear are still better than the bad movies of today. There is more of attention to the craft than the movies today. The biggest networking advice I can give is don't approach people that you want to work with like you want to get something out of them. Approach it like you have something to give them that they can't find anywhere else. Hey, welcome to The Create Unknown, the home of Make Something, Mean Something. It is TCU's day. We are here live every single Tuesday on Discord. Jo Discord. This is this is part of my new accent. We're here uh, on Discord. Uh, I am Kevin Lieber. Uh, not here uh, is Matthew Tabor. He's going to be off this week. He's going to be off the following week. So you're just going to get some media talk with Kevin the, the next two episodes. Tonight, we're going to chat about movies. Next week, Johnny Millennium is coming back onto the podcast, and we're going to do video games. But I have the movie guy here with me. Today, it is the Kino Corner coming back into the Create Unknown. Kino, thank you for joining me, and uh, I'm looking forward to chatting about some film stuff with you. Yeah, I mean, how long has it been? Like a year and a half, two years, I think? A couple it's been of years, a while. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think the last time I was here, I had 100,000 less subscribers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it all happened like last year, uh, just out of sheer luck. But uh, um, that was because of your literally me videos, wasn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. And then that kicked off. Um, and this is, you know, this is to anyone who's starting a YouTube and might feel a little uh, might feel a little down. Uh, what happened is that video popped off and a lot of my older videos that were sitting at maybe like like my one video on Lars von Trier's Antichrist had been sitting at like 3000 views for months. And then last summer it shot up to. Now it's at almost 800,000. Wow. Um, and so that was a video. I was like, oh man, that bombed so badly. And like, nothing's getting anywhere. When one video, you know, I guess they say, you know, the rising tide raises all boats. So mm -hmm. that that just sort of happened. But yeah, I can, mean, it's all luck. Can can you um, explain for our audience just a, a little bit more about what the Literally Me series is? <laughs> just so, so they can uh, understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so... You know, these are all movies that I, I really like and I watch all the time, uh, like Taxi Driver, uh, Buffalo 66, um, American Psycho, uh, uh, Fight Club, Nightcrawler. You know, it's it's all these movies that really f mainly focus on on alienated men uh, and they deal with how men deal with alienated. They deal in different ways with how men deal with alienation and in society and they kind of these are movies that sort of um, deal with uh, major societal problems and really through the uh, eyes of of young men too. you know, Patrick Bateman is only 27. Um, Travis Bickle, I think, is supposed to be 26 or 27, like men in their 20s that feel very isolated and they deal with it in specific ways. And it's not that every one of these movies is is alike. They're actually very, very different. I don't know how you would necessarily compare American Psycho to Fight Club other than the kind of social political critique. Um, I don't know how you compare Buffalo 66 to Nightcrawler, um, except just, I mean, they're kind of getting at similar themes, but through very, very different ways. And a lot of these characters are super charismatic, which I think is what draws a lot of people to liking them. Lou Bloom and Nightcrawler is incredibly charismatic. Uh, he's a fun character to be with. Uh, same with Travis Bickle and Billy Brown and um, Tyler Durden. You know, it, it's yeah, it, it, it's way more of an amorphous genre than like other genres. Like with horror, you you kind of know what you're getting into with the film that there's going to be 
some sort of monster or it's going to be shot in some way. Um, it's going to have maybe it's probably going to have boobies uh, with most <laughs> horror films. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, um, cause I mean, there's a, uh, I, I've been getting into a lot of the uh, exploitation film side of things. And there's a larger crossover between the porn industry and horror filmmaking than probably most people know, but um, yeah. And you know, with comedy, you're expected to laugh when you see that a movie is in the literally me genre. It's you, it doesn't really tell you much except that possibly it's it's about an alienated young man. Um, But I also really, what's really interesting to me is that, that age bracket. Cause I, I never put that together that they were all in that sort of like mid to later mid twenties. And -hmm. I think that that's a really interesting thing to note. Uh, Anecdotally, I remember when I was 25, I was working at a bar as a bartender and I was talking to an older gentleman who came, who was a regular, who would come in all the time. We would chat about life. And I, I'll never forget that he explicitly, I, I was lamenting, like not knowing what I was going to do with my life, that sort mm-hmm. of, you know, thing. Um, and he flat out was like, look, 25 is the worst age. That is the <laughs> yeah. worst age that you can be. And I remember being like horribly depressed when I was 25. So you need to oh, kind same of here. Uh, uh, like uh, accept. Uh, he, he was giving me the, this advice as, uh, you know, he was in his 60s. He was like, understand that it's okay to be feel, feel like kind of confused and lost and you don't know where your place is. Like that's sort of not everyone's, it's not, it's not a universal experience, but it's a pretty common experience when you're, you're like sort of, you're, you're, you're you're old for college you know you're like out of college but you're you're not experienced enough in the job marketplace to have any footing there and you're just in this like bizarre limbo really between like delayed adolescence and adulthood yeah i mean really the 20s is the new like adolescence because you're you know when you're in college you're still a kid you know you're just like i mean you might be working like a barista job or, you know, as a bartender or something like that, but you're not really in the workforce, you know, at least in the career that you want to be, unless, you know, you, you do want to be a barista or, or a bartender your whole life. Um, and so especially that mid twenties, it's, it, that's also where you, where you reach the paradox in the job market of trying to, and I, I definitely uh, saw this quite a lot of applying to jobs and it's like, yeah, we want you to have experience, but then you realize that you have to work this specific job to get that experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you just feel like, oh man, like nothing is ever going to happen with my life. Um, And yeah, and that's, and you have the brain of an adult, but you are stuck in this kind of adolescence and there's this uh, resentment, depression, angst. I like, I felt way more angst in my mid twenties than I did in my teenage years. My teenage years were fine. You know, I I was Mm -hmm. a good kid. Um, you know, I have nothing to complain about with being a teenager you, because and maybe this is the difference between like our generations and the generations before us. You aren't really guaranteed anything in, in the workforce or in society. You know, it's not like the old days, right, where it's like, yep, I'm going to get out of school. I'm going to work at my my dad's shop and that like I'm going to, you know, join the family business or something, especially if you're somebody who wants to do something different like my parents are. My dad works, you know, was in the military and my mom's a pediatrician. I didn't want to do either of those, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, uh, so I had to like set out on my own and, and that's, that's a lot harder um, and leads to a lot more frustration and, you know, and that's what you see in, in these different movies. Uh, now with American Psycho, where that's a little bit different and that's what, and actually I, I held off on making my video for like a year. Cause I didn't know how to approach that at all. Like to say something new, um, because he is a guy that's working for his dad's company. Um, but really what American psycho is about is, is another trap. It's kind of the almost opposite of what Travis Bickle and taxi driver is, or Travis Bickle is this like alienated guy with like no prospects, PTSD from a war living in a hovel in New York, New York city, you know, just as like this old rundown apartment. Although to people in New York City now, they probably look at his apartment and go, man, he really had it made. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> um, three grand a month. Yeah. Ex- oh, easily, easily yeah. three grand. I, I was just, uh, um, I'm actually going back to New York in, in two weeks, but I was just in New York in 
October, November for an event that my friends uh, were putting on. And I, when I go to a new city, I, I, I'm becoming like my parents. I like to look at the, uh, I like to look at the real estate, you know, that's like a, a thing that I like to do in cities that I visit. Like, oh yeah, what, hmm, what are these apartments going for? <laughs> what are these houses in Long Island going for? And I was shocked. Austin is pretty bad by itself. Austin's getting up to LA prices, but I mean, but with American Psycho, uh, it's being completely consumed by the consumerist culture. And it is this really kind of undying want, desire to to fit in. You know, and this hatred for himself that he has uh, of wanting to fit in, and it's and I think that that's another you know like you see uh, um, people especially in their mid twenties to thirties, and I think it's even more prevalent now than it was maybe even back in the eighties of being completely consumed by like the religion of consumerism, whether it's Star Wars or or Disney or um, or you know cars or keeping up with the joneses you know all that all that sort of sort of stuff and and and, uh in this desire to just fit into society while also being very very much against um society at the same time uh so i I, you know yeah the mid-20s are a very very weird very weird time and it doesn't surprise me that so many rock stars die at 27 (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah 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 you're just sort of stuck between oh well i i should have it figured out by now but i don't have it figured out by now and what does that say about me uh you know mm-hmm. so that that's definitely uh something that i think a lot of people feel as i guess exemplified by these literally me m- movies that are very very yeah. popular these are not obscure films that you have to like dig through some strange no, yeah. Uh, I yeah, I figured, list I figured, to find. I, yeah, I figured out on my channel that if I make a whole video dedicated to an obscure film that nobody's going to watch it because no one's heard of it, they don't want to, or you know, they might like see that I'm talking about it, and they won't watch the video because they don't want it spoiled. And I mean, I still, I still like to make those videos, probably more so than any other kind of video. But um, that's why I started doing these uh, uh, recommendation videos. Um, of like movies that you have to see and it's just blurbs it's basically like 500 word blurbs for each um for each movie just to kind of expand people's you know palettes i guess I, i'm doing a new one i'm putting together a new one right now about movies to watch on father's day with your dad with all some of my favorite dad movies mm-hmm. um that are a little less um i'm not going to say that they're not famous movies they're famous movies to dads but maybe not to zoomers you know? Wait, what what is an example <laughs> of a famous movie to dads? Sneakers. Oh, okay. S- sneakers and um Bullet, you know. Okay. Uh, you know, those the like those the, the movies I watched with my dad like growing up. I was thinking of I was thinking of doing one for Mother's Day. <laughs> um but I never really watched that many movies with my mom and then I so, you know, my mom is like not as like my dad was the movie guy in my family. So I was like, ah, I don't know what to do for Mother's Day. And then I was thinking, I was like, as a joke, maybe I'll put number one, Oedipus Rex by Pasolini, <laughs> <laughs> which I have the poster for right here. <laughs> you, you literally do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. But <laughs> I, I was like, no, I, I, I won't do that. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the Dragon's Treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler pack you'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. 
And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, you'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. <laughs> well, well, this this brings up something that I actually had thought of over the past couple of days when I was thinking about you coming on the podcast and just movies in general. And um, one thing that Spotify does really well, I think that everybody knows it for, is um, you can create and share playlists, right? So, mm -hmm. and Spotify is pretty well known for that. You can have, I mean, you see kind of like funny playlists just on online all the time that people you know, put together that spell out something or wh whatever. But this is like a, a, a sort of a communal social element to Spotify in which you can follow, you know, your friend's favorite music or, or songs, or even if it's just somebody you look up to and say, hey, here's a new playlist. And I find that really lacking in the film space. And, and I'm sure there are many, many reasons for that. One is that movies come and go all the time off of these platforms so they're not often available or there's just so many different platforms that something is on HBO Max and something else is on Netflix and something else is on Hulu and some other thing is on Paramount Plus or whatever. They're just all over the place. So there are a lot of reasons, I guess, why this is hard to do. But my point is, is that for, for the younger uh, listeners out there, back in the day at video stores, there were staff picks. This was a thing. This is a well-known mm -hmm. thing where uh, your local video store would have staff picks. I'm pretty sure there was a whole Seinfeld episode in which like Elaine falls in love with one of the staff picks at the video store and he ends up being a nerd or something. I might just be making that up, but I'm pretty sure that's one of the Seinfeld plots. But the point is, if is you could have a curated film recommendation when you walked in to say your local video rental store and say, hey, you know, I really like this guy. I like Kino's taste. Like he, he and I have really good taste. I like his recommendations. Uh, I will watch this movie that he recommends. It's a shame to me that, and I think it, it seems like there's a market, like a gap in the market for this type of service in which I could just log into something. I don't know what it is, whether it's Netflix well, or some other app and say, Oh, here's what like Kino suggests I watch this weekend. I'll check it out. Yeah, I mean there is Letterboxd. Um, How does that I have, work? Uh, I just, I mean, I don't really follow a lot of people on Letterboxd because I don't really care what other people are <laughs> watching. I just follow some <laughs> of my friends. So you, so you hate this idea? <laughs> uh, no, fundamentally, no, I, I, I think the idea is I have a different, I have a different take on it. So people can go and they can see like. I, I usually log movies that I watch. Sometimes I forget. Uh, sometimes I take like I'll log it like five days after I watch it or something. Um, and then I'll sometimes I'll get my thoughts on it. Sometimes I won't get my thoughts on it. Like, for example, just for the first time last night, I watched uh, Gummo and I don't know that I can give thoughts on it immediately after. It's just like I really liked it, but. I, I need to sit with it for, for a bit to like, for, for about a lifetime <laughs> <laughs> when you're on your deathbed, you'd be like, I finally have an opinion on gummo. <laughs> I mean, I like, I was, I was engaged the entire time. It, you know, it, uh, some parts of it almost felt like proto million dollar extreme, uh, harmony Corinne. I know that his whole thing is he wants to make perfect nonsense. And I'm tip I'm, I really love spring breakers. Um, and I watched some of his, I've seen some of his other like short films. I remember watching Trash Humpers and not really liking it uh, a couple of years ago, but that wasn't even intended as a movie as far as I was told. Um, it was more intended as a prank, which makes a bit more sense to me. Uh, but yeah, people, can, people can, can look at what I'm watching and then, you know, sometimes I'll watch some really obscure thing. Like I have a, a subscription to this like, obscure eastern european movies site uh that i watch a lot of weird like yugoslavian films on um, <laughs> and <Okay>. uh, <laughs> yeah which i'm a big fan of yugoslav cinema um a uh, shout out to the serbs croats what, bulgarians albanians uh uh gosh what are all the different uh yugoslavian countries <laughs> um sh uh shout out to all those people um but I think that the the issue between like music and movies is that 
uh, the best cinematic experience, the best ex- movie watching experiences I've ever had have been in the cinema. Uh, they haven't been at, at the home. I've watched plenty of great films at my home and I try to, you know, like pay very close attention, but it's much easier to get distracted when you're at your house, whether it's like somebody's calling you up or, um, I don't, it, there's a million di- different distractions at your house and you're also alone. And I think that with a lot of movies, uh, it really helps to to watch it with an audience, especially comedy films like comedy films do not hit the same when you're watching it alone on your couch. You know, I watched um, and thankfully in Austin, we have the Austin Film Society and I go there all the time to watch films. I just saw Irreversible on 35 millimeter, um, which was what it was like watching it for the first time. Um, I saw Apocalypse Now, the final cut. And watching I that, just rewatched that. That's so funny. Watching that in the cinema, the sound design really stands out. I mean, above everything else, like the cinematography is Vittorio Storaro um, is a cinematographer for that. He was also Bertolucci's cinematographer. So he shot like The Conformist and uh, Last Hang on Paris and The Last Emperor. Really, really fantastic cinematographer. So seeing his like images on the big screen, it was just fantastic. But the sound design. Uh, the opening of it when the screen is still black and you hear the helicopter sounds when you're in your house watching it you're you're hearing it come from your speakers and look your speakers in your house you can have 7.1 dolby surround sound or whatever is not going to match up to a cinema um it sounded in the movie theater like there was a helicopter circling above the theater and we could hear it circling above us and i was like holy shit this this is like I this is going to be me watching Apocalypse now for the very first time, even though I'd seen it several times. I just mm-hmm. knew from the very first sound that this was going to be a whole new experience. And and then, you know, at movie theaters like AFS, um, people like and, and this is the other big part of 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 movie watching in cinema is that people will hang around. Um, they'll hang around after and you know, you, uh, you go outside, you light up a cigarette, you find the other, uh, smokers, right. And then there's a whole circle, uh, just outside the cinema and you talk for like 30, 40 minutes, just about the movie, about a lot of different things, about ideas that kind of, you, you know, that came to you when you're watching the film, you go on all sorts of tangents and everything. But I feel like that communal experience is super, super important to watching, to watching films. And you're just not going to get that. And I think that, like people can follow me on Letterbox and they can see what movies I'm watching and they can watch on their laptops or their PCs or their TVs or or whatever. But it's just not gonna it's just not gonna match that experience. And I think that's really where cinema and music are different because music is a lot more for me. It's a lot more personal. Um, where I can like just be in my car or be in a walk or something, you know, listening to it and just taking it in all very personally you know and then you go to you'll maybe see the artist one time in concert and it's a great experience right. but the recorded music is something that's i think that's very personal and um and uh but movies i think should be watched with an audience i think that's i think that's the biggest thing um mm-hmm. and that more theaters need to do like repertory screenings like i <laughs> i went out to la in august um and i was staying with my friend uh uh was, <laughs> so my friend uh is a singer um ariel pink and he got a ticket to see the brown bunny in 35 millimeter at the new beverly and i don't know if you've seen that movie it's quite I haven't, the movie. I, you, know, you know what i don't think that i've watched a single vincent gallo movie i don't think i've vincent, seen one. Oh, uh, vincent gallo is so great now he's only directed two films that have released which are Buffalo 66 and The Brown Bunny. He's directed other films, but he hasn't released them. He, he claims that he will never release Promises Written in Water because uh, part of the part of the uh, uh, allure for the film for him is it just being his own and it not being out for the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. And people have been begging him ever since 2010, so for the last 13 years, to release it. And he just always says no. Um, hopefully... I mean, I want to see it someday, but I'm also like, yeah, I, re- I respect that. You know, you, you keep it to yourself. <laughs> he's since, I think, shot two movies. I, I'm not sure. He's, but he's directed other things. Just They just haven't been released. Um, but the Brown Bunny, uh, of course, 
uh, made quite the splash at the Cannes Film Festival uh, because Roger Ebert hated it so much. And also because it has that uh, scene of unsimulated, uh, unsimulated, uh, um, how do I say this and, and still get this uh, monetized to green? Um, um, unsimulated, uh, or, or, let's just say. Or, 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 uh, oral, oral interaction. <laughs> Chloe Sevigny <laughs> eats a corn dog on screen. Um, <laughs> and it's real. <laughs> and actually, during, right before that scene, because I'd seen the movie a couple times, right before that scene, I nudged Ariel and I was like, all right, get ready. <laughs> I was like, here's the big scene. <laughs> Um, and what did, what did Roger Ebert say? Cause I remember that was a big deal. He like really hated it. Right. He said, so he did end up giving it three out of four stars. Um, oh. so he did end up liking it. Oh, okay. Uh, but what happened at the Cannes film festival was that the company that was releasing it s- told Vincent Gallo, you have to show this movie at Cannes or else we're not going to give you an extension. Um, and he hadn't finished editing the film yet. So he needed that extension. So what they ended up showing at the Cannes Film Festival was essentially an assembly cut. Um, it was a rough cut of the film. So it was not the movie that you see today. It was, as I think, 30 minutes longer. Um, and, uh, you know, he didn't he didn't necessarily want to show that version of the film. Um, it was he was strong armed into doing it. Roger Ebert reportedly during the critics screening of it uh stood up and started singing in the middle of the of the screening and kind of ruined what? the experience for everybody else which is why vincent gallo <laughs> uh wished rectal cancer on him um and roger eber did get cancer right after that but it was uh it was a different kind of cancer and uh vincent i think it was it wasn't throat cancer i think that's what he got later on in life um I forget what kind of cancer it was, but yeah. And uh, uh, <laughs> then Vincent Gallo and Howard Stern famously said, yeah, I think it was good for him. He's now eating healthy and he's not so fat. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, that is morbid. <laughs> but they, they they made up on the... It, Gallo still has it against Roger Ebert because he does kind of rightfully believe that Ebert sort of sank his career. Uh, he didn't need the money or anything after that. Like, he got rich off of real estate, um, but his film career was dead in the water for quite some time after that can screening, mm-hmm. uh, even though Roger Ebert did end up giving it a good review upon its like final theatrical release. And it's oh, it's a movie that okay. people they just know one. They just know that one scene. Uh, and so in a video recently, I, I recommended the Brown Bunny and I that that's another movie about loneliness and and trauma and and tragedy and grief and it's it's about a lot of things um and i'm kind of i'm happy to see that in the last like 20 years since its release it has been 20 years actually which is wild but um it's now coming around and being seen as 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 a classic it's now being seen as like a classic of indie cinema but you know gummo was the same it got panned i was reading some of the reviews for it um Yeah, and you can understand why. I mean, it's a bizarre film that's a little tough to sit through and stomach and certainly, well, really most of it, you know, you kind of have to be uh, in a certain mindset in order to come away I, with it being like, wow, I really, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I, I think, I think too, that you just have to be a person that's not like in the bubble of a uh, coastal city to, you know, like I grew up in Florida you know, and mm. so many of these characters reminded me of like real life people that I knew, um, you know, that I went to school with. And to me, it just felt very real. Um, you know, there's definitely moments of like absurdism or surrealism, like the whole character of the, the bunny kid mm-hmm. feels like this uh, dreamlike character who's like mm-hmm. uh, taking us around the town. Um, but like the, the one kid, Solomon and his friend that go around shooting cats and, and their whole story felt super real. And then I'm, I don't think that most of those people in there were actors. Like there was so. Chloe, there was Chloe, Se- Chloe Sevigny, of course, who also yeah. was in the Brown Bunny, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> in the famous scene. And, uh, and, uh, and it did have a pretty good, like, um, independent, uh, crew. Uh, when I was seeing the credits, uh, the opening credits for it, I was, I was actually kind of astounded. It had Randall Poster as the music supervisor. He's a, 
absolute legend. I don't know where he was in the mid nineties, but he's the music supervisor for Wes Anderson and for like a lot of big time directors. Um, and then it had, uh, the editor was Christopher Tellefson, who is Whit Stillman's editor. Um, whose movies are all very superbly edited. Um, and when I saw all those, cause I was a little unsure about coming going in, I saw all those credits. I was like, okay, this is probably going to, this is probably going to be different, but it's also probably gonna be pretty good. And I was, I was very happy. I was very happy with it. It wasn't as tough to sit through as some people were telling me, but maybe it's just that, uh, I had, have seen that world. Um, yeah. And you have a thick skin for that sort of thing. I mean, admittedly, <laughs> right? <laughs> like more than most. You, you have built up a callus over the years to uh, certain shocking elements in film, for sure. That's the thing um, about shocking cinema, though, is uh, and I guess that's why I'm like so drawn to it. Like movies that are really shocking because there are two categories of these shocking movies. And it's shocking movies that people tell you are shocking. Then you watch it and you're like, come on like are, are, you, are you serious about this right now and then there's movies that are actually shocking but the movies that are actually shocking are far 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 fewer um i did a video on one recently about martyrs that movie really gets under my skin quite a lot and then another film that really disturbs me i, I haven't been able to watch it again um has been the men behind the sun i don't know if you are aware of that film no i've never heard of it it's a Chinese propaganda film. I mean, it's admittedly a Chinese propaganda film. Um, very famous one, though. Uh, and, it's, and it is based on, on true events. It's about Unit uh, 731 uh, in Manchuria during World War II and uh, all the human experimentation that was done on the uh, Manchurian locals. And it is, and just the way that it was shot, they used real body parts. Um, like, there's real animal abuse in there. Um, there's a lot of like, just, they don't play around. <laughs> they don't play around. Uh, it's, it's a gripping movie, but that's one that I'm like, I don't know, make, yeah. I, I've thought about making a video on it. My friend owns the rights to it. So if I make a video on it, I won't have to worry about copyright claims. Um, <laughs> which is, <laughs> that's the one good thing. It's but. a plus. <laughs> Uh, um, but that is I one wanna, I don't know if I'll watch again. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. I want to, I want to ask you, uh, there, there's two other like real big topics that I, I want to discuss with you. Uh, one is the Banshees of Inish Sharon. Mm -hmm. We'll do that second. The, what I want to do first though, is, uh, reflect a little bit on this tweet that you put out a couple of weeks ago. Um, essentially just encouraging people to watch older movies. Oh yeah. And first of all, where did that come from? Do you think most people like are... Uh, I don't want to say afraid, but just think old movies suck and are boring. Um, so, so what prompted you to tweet that? And then also, <laughs> nothing prompts I mean, me to I, tweet anything. <laughs> nothing prompts me to tweet anything. It just come comes straight from your uh, your it's, psyche. It's it's usually late at night. Um, uh, it's usually late at night. I'm I uh, I haven't been drinking for months, so it's not coming from like I'm drunk and um, and and doing this. It's usually late at night, and that's when all my thoughts come to me. And right before I go to bed, I just like tweeting out some stuff that, you know, is going to get engagement. And I, I take pleasure. Well, it's tweeting out things I do believe like I'm I'm semi 
sarcastic on some tweets and and some tweets I'm, I'm pretty pretty honest about um and that one's one that i'm very honest about uh but i just uh <laughs> i like sending things out into the void and then ignoring anybody that uh, actually interacts with it um <laughs> but, th- but this is a real thing i mean scorsese tarantino like some of the most legendary directors uh, directors of all time have in recent years come out and really taken a dump on what's essentially like the last I don't know, decade of filmmaking yeah. in Hollywood. And, and I'm and with them. I'm with them 100% right. okay. on that. Yeah, yeah so yeah. am no, I. I'm with, like it I'm with it them seems 100%. objectively true that this era is horrific. So, I mean, the thing that is the most prominent to me is uh, PC culture. It's political correctness. It's uh, And political correctness, I think, has ruined comedy uh, of all things. I, like, I, I try to think about like the last great, just true comedy movie um you know like i, mean, I know we're going to talk about banshees and that's a comedy but i would, I would also say it's more of a drama with comedy elements but i agree. I, 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 try, I try to think about like what was like the last like really great really funny comedy movie like um and i i i think back and i think back and like i don't I don't think the Seth Rogen movies have aged particularly well. I don't really like the trope of the schlubby guy getting the hot girl. Um, I mean, it's fine, I guess. But um, I, I just think back. And I, I can't think about the last film that I saw in the theater that had me like roaring with laughter. It, everything feels so sterile now. Um, there are I, interesting. What about like, I mean, how far should we go back? Like Anchorman, The Hangover? Like they, mid two thousands, mid two thousands movies. These are yeah. old movies. <sighs> don't don't tell me, dude. I already feel old, man. Um, I remember what? seeing those movies in the theater. <laughs> yeah, dude. What year was Anchorman? Anchorman is almost dude. twenty years old. It's almost twenty. It'll be twenty years old next year. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. This is this is boomer hours right now. This is <laughs> this is. But yeah, I mean that movie is funny. Like I was watching through. Um, you know, some people accuse me of pretentiousness. Look, this last weekend, I I I went on an old parody movie kick, and I was watching some of the old Leslie Nielsen movies. Uh, Naked Gun is still hilarious. Um, yep. You know, and you know what? I watched all. I watched the first three Scary Movie movies. Now, I don't think Scary Movie one and two are funny, but Scary Movie three is very funny and. Uh, and there's a reason why it's so much better. And of course, Scary Movie 3 came out in 2003 or 2004, so around the same time. That was directed by uh, Zucker, um, who did Naked Gun and Airplane. Um, and that's why oh. the comedy of it was just... I never saw I, that. I never saw the third one. It's you know, it's not a great movie, but it is funny. And like, I like that in comedies. It's like they're not trying to be some artistic masterpiece or something they're not trying to be anything that they're not it's like family guy right where they're just trying to throw in as many jokes as possible in the shortest amount of time and some Mm -hmm. of those jokes, some of them are going to stick and some of them won't but if they can get some laughs out of you then they then they did their job and they're not and and like looking back at scary movie three uh there's so and well all the scary movies and all these like older parody films from the 90s and and 2000s anchorman too there's so many jokes that just wouldn't fly now that um there's a kind of weird morality now i think about humor especially and i think that that's really bad for our culture because i think that humor should be pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable uh because as i see i mean there's comedy just to make you laugh like visual gags and and things um like just because it's the most recent in my mind like there's this gag and scary movie three where it's like uh they're having boyfriend troubles and they're like okay well, let's eat this ice cream and they bring in like this gigantic tub of ice cream it's like 20 gallons you know and they're just eating through the whole thing and of course <laughs> <laughs> you know like that's <laughs> like it's just i mean it's stupid but it made me laugh um but there's a lot of comedy that uh pushes the boundaries on topics that are typically seen as taboo and now it's but I think that with changing morale, changing moralities, changing uh, uh, tastes, and uh, very, and not just that, but a very polarized culture, it's now a lot of the comedy is is really uh, pointed t- 
towards one specific audience. And that's usually, oh, you're making comedy for conservatives or you're making comedy for liberals. And both of those suck. Like both mm-hmm. of those are not funny. And, uh, and yeah, just, and especially in the last 10 years, it's gone downhill. But I've also noted, and this is a theory of mine, that the bad movies of yesteryear are still better than the bad movies of today. Uh, Cause you watch like these movies that were panned on, you know, release back in the 90s and 80s and whatever and they still had better filmmaking like there was still more of like a attention to the craft um than the movies today and i do kind of chalk that up to the uh, quote-unquote democratization of filmmaking with like dslrs and um with uh digital cinema uh that anybody now can go out and shoot a shoot a movie and the gatekeeping isn't I mean, the gatekeeping is still there, but it's it's definitely lessened. And I I just it, it's not something I can like prove scientifically or anything. It's just it's just a gut feeling that I have that um, just a lot of the craft has a lot of the craft has been lost. Uh, the uh, cultural attitudes just aren't there for comedy, especially. Um, and that movies in general, they just seem to be getting uh, American movies. I will say because I've seen quite a few really fantastic um foreign films even in this last year france is still making really good films uh japan japan is so so and they they still have some good directors like uh hirakazu karita whose most recent film he made in south korea called broker which i thought was excellent um uh but like yeah i i I don't know like a lot of movies now i just kind of have like a whatever impression to them and that does make like I will say that that does make the the really good movies stand out more, like Tar, for example. But then the director of Tar, Todd Field, said that he's probably not going to make another movie. So, you know, <laughs> really, yeah, he said that recently. He's probably not going to make another movie. And you know, I'm like, okay, great, <laughs> we lost another <laughs> one. And he's yeah, I ha- think you're yeah. right that 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 the the target of like, well, you can't make jokes about X, Y, Z anymore is usually at stand up, uh, which which isn't right. I think it seems like to me, stand up comedy still jokes about whatever it wants, whenever it wants. So I, I think that yeah. that is mostly wrong in that direction. But I think that you're right that it's almost entirely correct in the direction of things like like movies. I mean, for instance, there was just a thing trending recently about Friends being too offensive. Like Jennifer yeah. Aniston came out being like, Friends is, what? Friends is too shocking by... T-. It's like, f- guys, Friends was like the most milk toast, yeah. bland, middle America, boring, mo- boring sitcom you could ever imagine that's offensive hey, now come on now it was not the most <laughs> everybody loves raymond was definitely more milk toast <laughs> uh but no yeah uh, friends was like friends used to be like people i mean i remember when friends was on tv and like people thought you were just super lame if you liked friends like right oh my it was God. lame yeah it was a lame show when it was on uh it was su- super popular mm-hmm. but I-, I think like the general temperature around it was like it's a pretty lame show. Yeah, it was so tame and it like Seinfeld was way more uh crossed way more boundaries than Friends. And that's why Seinfeld is a superior show. And I haven't like I still watch episodes of Seinfeld. Um there's still like Seinfeld is still funnier than uh, just about any sitcom now. Uh It's Always Sunny was really funny for about 7 or 8 seasons. Um you know, and it's It's Always Sunny I I'd say is like the last holdout on TV of that kind of humor of like trying to offend i i I guess you could maybe say south park i haven't watched south park in the last five years um Mm -hmm. so i I can't really speak to where south park is now i know some people still really like it but um you know it's i like i was i've been listening recently a lot to the brett easton ellis podcast and he talks about and he just had an interview with the uh guy from the 1975 um and he was talking about how in his generation, Generation X, they liked being offended. Like there's something to watching a film that offends you that like really it's exciting. It's, right? It is exciting. I mean, it's like a it's like a titillating experience. Yeah. I don't mind. Like I like being offended. I like I watch pl- that. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? I watch these like 
shocking movies because I want to be offended by them. I, I, it's like, it's something it's, it's, I'm being confronted that the filmmaker, I, I can totally disagree with everything that the filmmaker is, is standing for in the film, but I have to respect I mean, the fact that look, he has the balls not, to confront me. It's not that unlike going to see a horror movie to be purposefully scared. Yeah, exactly. Like no one wants to be scared in real life. That yeah. sucks. <laughs> you don't want to be afraid for your life in real life. But yeah. horror is like the most popular genre aside from blockbuster films in, in all of cinema <laughs> Although, because people like yeah. to go and feel scared. Yeah. And you, and you look at actually, I think that there's <laughs> a big push now for horror because of what's lacking in other genres. You look at the last year and how many horror films we had. We had we had Scream 5. We had ha- well, we've had two Scream films in the last year. I haven't seen either of them. They didn't look that good to me. So um, we had Halloween Ends. We had Terrifier 2. We had um, The Menu. We, I mean, y- you look at the slate. Barbarian. Barbarian, which was, which was really good, I thought. Um, yeah, it, I liked it a lot. Yeah. And, you know, a movie like Terrifier 2 was made on a $250,000 budget and made something like over $10 million at the box office, which that's only something you would have really heard about maybe in the seventies, uh, you know, Halloween was shot on a, the first Halloween was shot on a budget of like $300,000. Uh, I mean, which today is like 1.5 million or something, it, but very, very low budget. And it did fantastically well. Um, Terrifier 2 did, uh, you know, we're seeing horror movies do really well right now because, because even if they're not super great, like I didn't particularly care for Megan, um, they still give audiences something that's really lacking in dramas and in comedies. And because mm-hmm. those, those fears have just sort of stagnated there. There's a stagnation. I think that's come from uh, partially because the, the people who were in Hollywood long ago are still the people who are holding the, the reins are, are kind of still holding the reins. And I think that there's a lot of fear uh, of if they do something that's going to be controversial, then that's going to, you know, they're going to have protests and they're going to have, you know, people boycotting or bad press. And I just think that that's so stupid. Like you look back at like, take, for example, um, the Scorsese and Paul Schrader movie, uh, The Last Temptation of Christ. And there were active protests outside of the uh, premiere of the film. There were tons of people Mm -hmm. picketing, you know, the movie. And what did Paul Schrader do? He just went and took photos with the protesters. Like they were like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> you know, this is great that people are angry that this movie exists. And, you know, Clockwork Orange, you know, the guy tried to kill Stanley Kubrick uh, while he was shooting Barry Lyndon because of a Clockwork Orange. And it was like, you know, everyone was just super like, oh, my God, how is this? This these kinds of movies should not be made, you know, but that kind of press like the studios understood back then that kind of press is actually is actually good um you know but now it's 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 like twitter mobs that that, that they're afraid of and uh, to give a, a a very real life example of this going back to um my friend uh, ariel pink i get I, I get shit online for being his friend i'll have random people uh dming my like family members tell me telling them that because i'm his friend i'm racist sexist etc 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 and these these weird guys i don't know who they are um, people like comment or sometimes replying under my tweets, you know, like basically with like fantasies about me. Um, and, uh, he recently came to Austin. I put on a, uh, um, concert for him in Austin during, during, uh, not affiliated with, but during South by Southwest, we had, um, we had over, we had 400 people waiting to get in that we couldn't let in because the venue was packed. Um, like it was, it was a sold out show. Um, it did really great. And then the next day he went down to San Antonio to perform at the Paper Tiger, which is a great venue. So when the Paper Tiger announced that on Instagram, uh, for Austin, we just kept it to word of mouth and it just spread like wildfire. I didn't have to even do like, I just, you know, told a few people around town who I knew would tell other people, you know, we just kind of did it like the old fashioned way. Um, and we, and we had that kind of attendance. Uh, the people in San Antonio put up a thing said hey tickets for the ariel pink concert are available and um they had to take that that instagram uh post down because they got flooded with a mob 
of saying like you need to cancel him he's a piece of shit blah 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 anthony fantano told me not to like him <laughs> you know all this kind of stuff mm-hmm. and you know what he went to the con like he he he, he i mean he was he was upset by it. Not super upset. He was kind of expecting that. But he went to the concert. You know how many people were there protesting? Zero. Like none of these people, <laughs> none of these people matter. There were zero right. people. You, and you right. know what? He like sold out the venue. And, and it's right. like that controversy probably got more people to even hear about it. Can you believe that this can you believe this guy is is, is playing his his pop music here? It's like <laughs> it's like yeah. you, you know, and um yeah, and so it and it was a great concert. I, I I couldn't go. I was so tired after the last night because man, putting on an event is not fun. But um, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. But the point the point is that the internet uh, and and real life don't actually or don't no. don't always correlate. The internet you might think the that internet they will. is not real. <laughs> anybody it could be some some it could be some guy in vietnam who's a troll right he's not uh, or or like more like more than likely it's somebody with no money who probably just doesn't want to get up their fat ass uh you know and just wants to talk shit online and the thing is is 13 years old yeah he's 13 years old and you know these (laughs) these movie studios are so afraid of these people and it's yeah. caused movies and it's caused movies especially comedy to really go down really go down in quality i as I said, I honestly don't remember the last time I found something. I was in the cinema and watching a comedy film, and it made me laugh a lot. I like no, I, when I was a kid. I, yeah, I don't know. It's been, but 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 let us now transition into a dark comedy that I just watched recently that I loved that that you've seen as well called yeah. The Banshees of Inna Sharon. Now, this uh, for for those listening, it's streaming on HBO Max. If you have that, I highly recommend it. Uh, my my little sort of tirade about play playlists and stuff earlier came as a result of being a little frustrated that I hadn't hadn't really gotten any sort of push on watching this movie. Like I had to remember a tweet that I had seen like a long time ago of somebody saying that they liked it. And then I was like, oh yeah, what was that movie? And then I had to like Google it and it's such a good movie. Uh, then I then I had to search on HBO Max. I was, okay, what is this about? I don't know. I'll watch it. And be- I loved it. it I, I liked it more than any film I've seen in like before, in literal years. Before we get to that, I do want to temper something that I said. <laughs> I think okay. this last year was great for blockbusters. I am so happy that we're now getting blockbusters that are not Marvel cape shit, you know? Mm. And I did really love Top Gun Maverick. And look, I loved Avatar too. And I loved the Batman. Um, and Batman was great. And, you know, and I was like, these, okay. Like to me, as far as blockbusters goes, it felt like a return to form. Like we're getting these different, you know, and sure that, you know, maybe they're sequels, legacy sequels or or whatever but but marvel to me is like gray goo it they all the all the movies look kind of gray you know they all kind of feel kind of gray and these movies even if they were sequels or even if they were like reboots like in the sense of the batman they felt fresh and so i will i will temper everything that i said with that i thought blockbusters last year were great i think that the horror stuff that was coming out was great and i think that people did vote with their wallets when it came to that you're seeing marvel movies now not doing quite as well i did see ant-man in the theater um the new one and that sucked big time um (laughs) i only watched it i only watched it get this i was like uh monkey asked me to 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 watch it for is and for like two weeks i was like no I'm, i'm not i'm not doing that i'm not doing that so then we had two guests on and the two guests the saturday night said we actually kind of liked it. And monkey's like, what? And then I said, okay, I'm not going to let you fight this battle alone. <laughs> so I went to a 9am <laughs> screening the next morning. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> I, you know, paid uh. like five bucks. Cause it was, it was below, even below a matinee. It was like, they were just opening up. They probably would have just let me in, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. They haven't even made the popcorn yet. You're yeah. just drinking your coffee, watching <laughs> Ant-Man three miserably. Yeah, yeah. That's what I did. I just went to a Starbucks. I just brought my Starbucks coffee into the AMC <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, but that's the only reason why I watched it. But it, as far as I know, it barely made its, its budgeting and marketing back. It's not very profitable. So hopefully, hopefully there is, always in these times when things like seem the most dire, like we've been on, I think a fairly downward slope, there's been some really interesting directors come out of the last 10 years, like Robert Eggers. Um, oh, yeah. you know, love him. 
uh, they you know they've been doing really interesting things. Like The Northmen, for example, was one of my favorite movies from last year. Yep. But that's yeah, to- that totally bombed. I mean, the studio didn't know how to market that one at all. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. It's very artsy for like it's, a it's Hamlet. mainstream audience. It's Hamlet. You know, it's like I love Shakespeare. So it's like, oh, it's Viking Hamlet. That's badass. Um, and, you know, oh, wait, we're getting way off topic. Oh, we're getting I way to off talk topic. About Banshees oh, of no, no, no. So, okay. So to, to, to bring this back to Banshees, <laughs> sorry okay. about that. Okay. Um, is that another issue that I have with, with films now is all these streaming services. You know, you have um, HBO Max, you have Netflix, you have Hulu, Criterion Channel, Mubi. Um, I can't say anything bad about Mubi because they're going to sponsor me. So Mubi's great. I, I, I do love Mubi. Um, but the thing is, it's like it all adds up. And Paramount Plus, Peacock, uh, it, it, and it's like, okay, this movie is a, is a Peacock exclusive. This one's a Paramount Plus excuse. I, I haven't watched the new Beavis and Butthead movie uh, just because it's only on Paramount Plus. And I'm like... Gosh, I don't want to. I don't want to get another. Like, can I just rent it? I would rather rent it for like five dollars and pay than get into this fifteen dollar per month scheme to watch a film. Mm-hmm. Um, although mm-hmm. the Beavis and Butthead movie does look funny, um, I love Beavis and Butthead. Uh, <laughs> I love it to death. And um, you know, but it's just it's so scattered and it's just. And, and now it's like, oh, to have access to the movies to keep up with the culture, you got to pay. $150 a month, you know, or a crazy amount like that. And I think it just, you know, with the internet, we like early internet, we're like, oh, everything is going to be just easily available. And now everything is siloed into these pay, you know, behind all these different paywalls and everything is this one thing's over here. This one thing's over there. It makes it harder. It makes it harder to, uh, to watch the movies that you want to see. And so, but I do like HBO max. They've been doing a lot of good stuff. Um, and I do stand with Warner Brothers on canceling Batgirl because that looked terrible. I'm sure that they just watched. I'm sure they just watched the cut of it and they're like, "This is going to ruin the careers of everybody on this film." <laughs> um, yeah. But well, what, what I had yeah. heard is that they had a lot more money to spend to actually finish it, and they oh, were yeah. like, "Oh, we finished- are not going to spend another sixty million dollars on this freaking thing. It's just let's just cut our losses." In, it had finished production, but with those kinds of movies, a lot of the money is in post production. So it's VFX, yeah, yeah. But anyways, yeah. back to Banshee. So it is on HBO yes. Max. You can get it on Blu-ray. I think. I think you can get it on Blu-ray now. Um, I typically, I, I just try to buy the Blu-rays of movies because to me, that's just so much easier. It's like, okay, I have the disc here. I want to watch it. Like, I don't have to think about all this. Um, mm-hmm. But Banshees I saw in the theater and that is directed by Martin McDonough, who the Irish claim is one of them, but I believe he was, he grew up in England. Um, but I will say this is that he is one of the better Irish. He's, he's probably one of the best Irish directors and Banshees, now, I went to school, I went to college, Trinity College, Dublin, and Banshees for me was just like taking me back to my college years, just to how people talked, the kind of hu- the Irish humor that, that people have. Um, and it was very cozy. It was a very cozy movie, uh, just in that regard, hearing Feck all the time. <laughs> and, and, and cozy in the sense of the, the environment plays mm-hmm. so such a tremendous role in the storytelling uh you know really more so than most films where you really are kind of ensconced in the 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 stone fences and mm-hmm. just the rolling hills and the water have um, you have you been to really, the, really have you been to west I, ireland it's the only place i want to go i don't like traveling uh, the only two places I ever wanted to go are Japan and Ireland. I've been in Japan. I absolutely loved it. I've never been to Ireland, so it, it's on my list. So it's a short list. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, it takes. So Inishirin is uh like a fictional town, but it's based on Inishmore, um, which is one of the Aran Islands, and the Aran Islands are absolutely stunning. They're off the coast of Galway, and if you go to Ireland, you have to just spend two days in dublin you can pretty much do everything in dublin in two days two days in dublin then then get get the hell out of there go to galway um galway city and then the Aran islands and the Aran islands it's it's like it it still feels very or at least when i was in ireland back in the mid 2010s um still feels 
very much like how it feels in the Banshees of Inisherin, because uh, it's it's a very very old uh, town, you know, this going all the way back to like pre Roman era. Uh, people still live in these old houses. They still speak, you know, it's a Gale talk. Uh, they still speak Irish there primarily. Um, I mean, they all speak English, but technically they their primary language, I believe, is Irish, which is very different than scotch and it's very different than welsh you know it's a weird language um and uh and it feels almost like when you're going to the Aran islands that you're going back in time and so and it has this feeling of and, and, and this is the feeling that persists throughout the banshees of an Asheran, of being like in this 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 place it's almost like a time capsule of the old ireland right and you have Colin Farrell's character Porrick, um, and what what was um, Brendan Gleeson's character's name? Calm. Calm. Yeah. So so Porrick kind of represents like the traditional Irish man, and Colm is uh, he he. It's kind of like a, a, he's the person that feels like the tradition is holding him back. Right. He wants to be on par with like the rest of Europe. You know, amazing things are being made in, in France and Germany and. Uh, England at the time, and he feels like he's held back by this like small Irish town where Pork is very you know content with how he lives, and he doesn't really care to live like the rest of the Europeans. That he's the, very happy. He's very happy with his simple life. Yeah, and and those kind of contradic- contradictory uh, sentiments still exist in Ireland. There's still, at least when I was there, there was still a uh, um, you know a lot of my friends' parents. I knew uh, I knew several people who were like Pork, and I knew a lot of people who were like Colum. That they were like, no, oh, we're we're so backwards as a country. We need to we need to catch up to the United States. We need to catch up to Europe. You know, like we're so backwards, mm-hmm. and and it's definitely a very kind of a as I experienced it as an American, like living in Ireland, kind of being a little bit on the outside, uh, being the American there. Um, you know, that's that's at least what I how how i saw things and i talked to a few of my irish friends um after seeing the movie and they all agreed with (laughs) this assessment so i'm a little bit confident in it um and it's something that you know the movie is in 1923 and um and it's something that still exists to this day and it's definitely a a, this kind of national struggle or, or polarization of this want for traditional life but this want also for uh, to kind of join civilized society, but but what is civilized society? You know, is it just completely cutting out your friend and then chopping off your fingers? <laughs> you well, know? and also legacy, like that's mm-hmm. really uh, another a- element of it that Colm is really driven by is, you know, if I die in 12 years, you know, will I be forgotten? What will I be remembered for? You yeah. know, Parik, you, you won't be remembered for anything. And that's not even a thing that Park thinks about. Like yeah. he doesn't care. It doesn't even enter his head. There's just so much, uh, like, like interesting human dynamism mm-hmm. to me about that film that there are so, f- so few, like I have such a strange relationship with movies. Okay. I went to school for, for, for film. I love film, but like most of them, I really I don't like. Mm-hmm. A small percentage of them, I think, are okay. And then there's this like tiny, tiny sliver at the top of that uh, iceberg, like the little, little sort of like scraping on top that are so impactful to me that I love them almost more than like anything else. They they're so impactful to me, and they mean so much to me. And I think about them for days and weeks, and sometimes years to come. And uh, certainly this was one of those where I think I watched the movie on Saturday, today's Tuesday, and I've thought about it on and off um, all day for the last few days, just about how, uh, so so I don't want to get into any spoilers because that's lame. Um, I think- Oh, I, I just spoil everything it. on my channel. <laughs> Well, I want people to watch it for themselves. Yeah. I, I don't I don't like spoilers. I don't even watch trailers. I just watch the movie See, without I, even really knowing I'm much like the about opposite. Them. I can have a movie spoiled for me entirely and I, I don't care. It doesn't you still enjoy it. Yeah, I can still uh, enjoy a film. No, I like I like being completely virginal in my viewing experience. But um yeah, I I will just say that what's fascinating about it is just the sort of slow transformation 
of the main character. Mm -hmm. And you get to see the different motivations along the way that sort of led to that and the different dynamics between this guy and his former best friend. That's not spoiling anything. They're no longer best friends as of about eight seconds into the movie. Yeah, it's like, uh, but you liked me yesterday. Right away. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you liked yeah. me yesterday. Yeah, but I don't like you today. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. I, I think the other thing- It was it, great. I think the other thing about Banshees is that um, you can, uh, uh, I think everyone can see a bit of themselves in both characters. Right. Like, I think we'd be lying to ourselves if we say that we don't want to have a legacy. You know, I think that that's something, especially as you get a little bit older, you know, when you're 17, 18, uh, and you're of a certain mind, right? Like when I was 18, I, uh, I was like, I want to be the, uh, Nietzschean man. Right. I want to like, I feel like this is like a lot of, you know, teenagers around that time, right. Around that age. Like I want to be the Nietzschean man. I want to like forge the path. I want to like create this like stake in the world that's mine that lasts for generations uh and then as i've gotten a little bit older i still have that desire but you also just see the beauty in just having a good life like mm -hmm. you know and just being happy in your life and not having to worry about legacy uh and what it seems like to me like with column is that he's kind of he's been content in his life and it's kind of like he's having this i don't even want to say it's a midlife crisis it's it's kind of like, like an end life crisis yeah it's like an end life he's crisis. really worried about his mortality yeah yeah and this like this fear of death kind of is like encapsulates that movie and i think that it's really brought to him and it's and it's really and this is something that kind of happens in the background throughout the film is that the uh irish civil war is going on you know, so there's this like encroaching war. They're protected from it because they are on this island, you know, but it's like when there's a war going on in your country, you think about death, like, mm -hmm. and you think about what if I'm gone tomorrow? Is the world just going to keep, is the world just going to keep moving on without me? I mean, the answer is, yeah, <laughs> the world, you know, mm -hmm. the world is going to keep spinning. You'll, you'll be dead. You'll be dead. The world's going to keep going. And, and it's like, and I haven't done anything with my life. I've been drinking every day. I've been maybe playing the fiddle at the pub, you know, doing a few things. And he just wants to uh, make a musical piece that he can be remembered by. And But he does go about it the wrong way and completely alienating anybody they sees as, as dead weight. Um, but this is like this overreaction from like a panic that he has. And what he essentially does is he sort of brings that kind of modern cynicism into this kind of tranquil town. You know, it's, it's like he brings the, the Nazgul into the it's Shire. A, it's, it's a bit of, yeah, it's a bit of an infection. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, that yeah, it's like a nihilistic, a nihilistic infection. Yeah. So um, I do want to hit a couple of questions here um, from our listeners. Vibecat says, uh, in the movie, between the two characters, who was in the right? Choose only one. Um, Pork. To me, this is a really this is a really easy answer. Yeah, Pork it's definitely in, Pork, Pork was in the right. Yeah. Pork, Pork didn't do Colum, anything. Colum is the bad guy. <laughs> Pork didn't do anything. He just wanted to. He no. just wanted to hang out with his friend. That's all he wanted to do. That's it. Was just hang That's out with it. his friend and you know drink Guinness. <laughs> and like Colum could have easily just made time for himself and said like, "Hey, I need to focus on this now. Uh, so I'm not going to be at the pub every day, but I want to focus mm -hmm. on this." And it would have. It would have been so easy, but it, but the the thing is, is that humans we typically don't uh, we typically overcomplicate our lives for no good reason, <laughs> you know, and that's what he does. Yeah, yeah, highly recommend that. All right, we have uh, one more question uh, from from our patrons. Dan the Latch asks you, Kino, how does one become a script doctor or get into script coverage? Uh, it's not hard. Get an internship. There's they're a dime a dozen, or at least they used to be. I, I don't know anymore because I'm completely, I've been out of that world for um, five, six years. Uh, what I can say is that if you want to get, if you want to, you know, get up in, in the industry, uh, just don't stay inside, you know, go to events, go to parties. You don't have to drink. You don't have to like be wild or anything, but it like, it's, 
it is about knowing people. I, I've met a lot of great people just uh, just by saying yes to going to some rando party where I didn't know anybody, but my friend brings me and then I meet a lot of great people that way. Um, and usually, you know, and then at some point you'll meet somebody who you're on a similar wavelength to. And if you can have something, if you have a skill, like, like for example, um, hone your skills, hone your script writing skills, you know, write some features that you're never going to make, um, but polish them so that they are pretty good. And if you can show that to somebody and they can trust you that you have good judgment when it comes to storytelling, characters and that sort of thing, then they might say, hey, can you like take a look over this script and can you help me with editing this script? It's not it's not a fast process. It's a very slow process that you have to be able to develop relationships and you have to be able to always get better. Like with every project you do, you should be uh, challenging yourself in some way. You should be uh, setting different parameters. Uh, like I'm writing a script right now. Um, it's like a taxi driver starring uh, Eggy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'd watch that. I have uh, and I have parameters on it like that I have to keep the dialogue to an absolute minimum. So it's like writing a script where it's almost all action lines. You know, it's like writing and and um, like I have a friend who who's writing a script right now. And I think his parameters even more strict than mine that he can only have 50 lines of dialogue in the entire film. And I'm not saying that that should be the way that you go about it. But maybe one of your things is I need to have the dialogue feel as natural as possible. So when you're writing it, getting your friends to come and do readings of it and then tweaking it. It's like, how do I make something that feels real? Or you can take on a genre that you don't even know that much about. And you're like, so maybe you like writing dramas or comedies or something. And then you say, okay, I'm going to write a horror movie because like that's something that's completely, completely out of my wheelhouse. It's good to be able to dive into that and to learn about how those stories are told. Um, and if you can just keep doing that with yourself, it doesn't always have to be features. You know, it can be shorts and stuff. If you just keep working at it, um, you'll get good enough and then you'll get good enough to where people can depend on you. And that's really the the most important yeah. thing is getting somebody to depend on you. And then and then, then you're, you're, you know, and if you're going out, you're meeting people, your network is going to grow and that's how you get work. I mean, that's how I ended up in Austin. Uh, you know, as a person, person had seen something I had done. Um, I got brought on as an editor to a project. I was then brought out to Austin to do sound mixing um because i had taught myself you know production sound mixing and uh and then i ended up getting a full-time gig here as a filmmaker so you know um that's just i mean it, it's it's a slow process you just have to learn just learn how to network well and the biggest networking advice i can give to people is uh a couple things treat the other person not like not like a star or a boss treat them like how you treat anybody else you know, uh, don't ask for selfies with the person you want to work with. Like that is, I never do that. <laughs> Good advice. That yeah. automatically puts you in the status of fan. It automatically stratifies your relationship. And then, um, three, uh, don't approach people that you want to work with. Like you want to get something out of them, approach it. Like you have something to give them that they can't find anywhere else. So that's how yeah. you do it. That's 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 really good advice. It is amazing how much of that industry, kind of in particular, in particularly and sort of uniquely, is so networking heavy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of sure. a lot of it industries, like oh, you know, it's famously the case in film, but a, a lot of industries are like this too. You know, if, if like you're more likely to get hired at a company if the boss knows that you're competent, that you're a good guy, um, that uh, he can depend on you. And, uh, you know, you have a relationship outside of the office, like a friendship, you know, um, you have something like you're more likely to get that job just because our own human biases. It's like, are you going to hire somebody that, you know, and you like, or are you going to hire somebody that you yeah. don't know? Yeah. 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 You got to get together or you got to uh, get along if you're going to work together. Yeah. Um, okay. I think, I think that, uh, we are good for this episode. Uh, here, here's the big takeaway. Go watch the Banshees of Inishirin. Definitely check it out. Uh, let me know what you think in the Discord. Let me know what you think on Twitter. Let Kino know what you think on Twitter. You should definitely follow him on Twitter. And also, of course, check out his YouTube channel, The Kino Corner, to find out why so many of these lost 20-somethings are literally him. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm actually taking a little break from YouTube now to focus on screenwriting and 
a lot of uh, family um, stuff has, has come up, so I, I need to spend more time with them. But um, uh, I will be coming back uh, at the beginning of May. Uh, Emp Lemon is staying at my house for about a week, and we're going to do some like half in the bag style videos on g- going in depth on Gummo. And I believe on Brian De Palma's Blowout, which is a great, great movie. Uh, then I'll come back uh, completely at the end of May to um, uh, to with a video with a literally me video uh, called Moss Miggleson, literally me, where I'll cover uh, one of my favorite movies from the last ten years. I know it was ragging on films the last ten years, but as I said, there are a lot of great foreign movies and indie films from the last ten years. Uh, Another round, um, which if you guys have not seen it, go watch another. Never heard of it. It's it won the Oscar for best foreign film a couple of years ago, maybe last year, maybe the year before. I don't, I don't know. My I, I lose track of time when it comes to years now. Um, it's about four school teachers who decide that their blood alcohol level is too low, so <laughs> they drink during the day to improve their performance. <laughs> and it actually that is the last time that is the last time I ever just like laughed a lot in the theater. That movie is so fun. It's one of my it became one of my all time favorites upon seeing it. Um, Thomas Vinterberg uh, directed it. F- amazing director um, where cinephiles will know him from his movie A Celebration, uh, one of the dogma movies of the 90s, which I think the very first dogma movie of the 90s, which is harrowing to say the least um and uh and also from his movie the hunt which was also with moss miggleson that i think is very prescient today it's it's it, it was like a me too movie before like years before the me too stuff even happened um and uh so i'll be coming back with a video on 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 moss miggleson uh one of my all-time favorite actors uh Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we will look forward to that. So we have two recommendations to leave you with. Uh, Banshees of Inisherin and another, another, another round. round. We'll definitely check that yeah. out. Another or Druk. Yeah. Oh. It's, known, it's known internationally as Druk, which just means drunk in Danish. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I wrote, I wrote it down. I'll check it out. Kino, it was a pleasure having you back course, on the Sam. podcast, man. And, and uh, yeah, we look forward to your future work. Um, uh, next week, we have Johnny Millennium. I'll be talking to him about the world of video games. So you don't want to miss that. Thanks to all of our patrons for hanging out and thanks for your questions. If you want to support the <laughs> podcast, please go to patreon.com slash the create unknown. We are out of here. We will see you next Tuesday. All right. See you space cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week, and the recent support has been amazing. Sidpoke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. Thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente de los Santos, Dan the Latch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Risebread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Videoger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetis Deletus, Jonas Walter, Nathan Robinson, Jelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer-editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71.